Good afternoon. Welcome to the Intellectual Property Practice Group's uh, panel for the convention this year. We're, we'll be discussing intellectual property and economic growth. Uh, we have assembled a panel of distinguished guests. I'll be introducing them initially, shortly, and then they will each have 12 minutes to speak, and then we'll, uh, we'll have a discussion among the panelists and proceed to questions and answers. Our first speaker, speaker will be Daniel Ravitcher. Uh, professor Ravitcher is a professor at Benjamin uh, Cardozo Law School in New York. He is also the executive director of the Public Patent Foundation, an organization that represents the interests of the public in the patent process. Uh, most notably, they're currently noted for bringing a challenge to patents on life forms. Next, we have a man who almost needs no introduction, but I will introduce him anyway, Professor Richard Epstein, uh, who is known for his many distinguished contributions to legal scholarship. Uh, and I don't think I really do need to go into them except to say that he's also uh, made significant contributions to the discussion of intellectual property well, law as well. Joining us also is Michael Moyer of uh, Boston University Law School. Uh, Professor Moyer researches on, in patent law, law and economics, antitrust law, copyright law, contract law, and regulation. He holds uh, both a JD and a PhD in economics from the University of Minnesota, and he, is, he recently published a book with James Besson entitled Patent Failure, How Judges, Bureaucrats, and Lawyers Put Innovators at Risk. Finally, we have Professor Scott Keefe, who recently joined the faculty of George Washington University Law School after several years on Washington University's faculty. He is, a, uh, he is also um, the Ray and Lewis Knowles Senior Fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution, where he directs the, property on, the project on commercializing innovation, uh, which studies the law, economics, and politics of innovation including entrepreneurship, corporate governance, finance, economic development, and intellectual property. Uh, Scott was recognized as one of the nation's top 50 under 45 by the magazine IP Law and Business. I will now hand it over to Professor, Professor Ravitcher. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mark. Oh, I'm too lazy to stand. I'll let you know when you have to. Oh, by the way, speaking at the microphone is not patentable. <laughs> Good God, you just committed a tort against right. yourself. I'm not being paid to be here, so I'm not going to answer any questions. Maybe you said. Is that your recommendation? Is the sound? <laughs> should, should he sit? Can you fix it all? No, I don't know. Oh. Is that better? <laughs> I can talk loud enough, and we don't need a microphone. Give him the hand over. Can we turn this off? Turn the mic away from the speaker. Yes. Straight to my mouth? Is there an echo now? We have a judge in the room, so I'm going to do whatever the judge tells me. Okay, is that better? Yes. All right, has my, have my, has my time started? No. I'll Thank start you very time. much for my... This is like <laughs> clinical trials before the FDA. All right, this did not happen in our dress rehearsal. Okay, so like I said, I'm not being paid to be here. I'm not going to answer any questions. I'm merely going to ask you questions. And my only question for you today is whether or not the intellectual property system can go too far. Can we have patents that are too strong, that are too broad, that last too long? If you say the answer is no, then perhaps we should all run over to Congress and advocate that the patent system be amended in the following way. Patents should last five million years. The penalty for patent infringement shall be hanging by, uh, in the public square. Uh, anyone who even thinks about infringing a patent shall be guilty. How many people want that type of a patent system? <laughs> okay. All right. 
for the reasonable people in the room, otherwise the majority, I think we can all agree it is possible for the intellectual property system to go too far. So we then have to ask ourselves, how can we ensure that our intellectual property systems, including the patent system, which is the one that I work mostly in, does not go too far? My first question would be whether or not we have to ensure that there is a fair process through which policy making occurs. If we have a democratically illegitimate process, then no matter what it produces is unacceptable to society. So what makes a process democratically illegitimate? Well, anything Dan Ravisher disagrees with. Right? What about if it's anything that any one of you disagree with? No. Right. The democratically legitimate process is one that results from input by all affected parties. Everyone gets to say what they want to say, and then our elected officials decide what's best to do. My problem with our current intellectual property system is that it is not being produced through a democratically legitimate process. Namely, the voice of those who are negatively impacted by expanded IP rights is very rarely, if ever, heard. The voice of the public, who has no idea what a patent is or how it impacts their life, is never heard in the halls of Congress when it comes to amending the Patent Act. The only people speaking to Congress about patent laws are those in favor of bigger, stronger, longer patent rights. And that, therefore, cannot produce law which is democratically legitimate. That's why I was very happy to be invited to speak to you today as merely a representative of what I see as the public's voice uh, to push back against larger, bigger, stronger patent rights and intellectual property rights. Now, that doesn't mean I think my voice should always win. I merely think that it should be given adequate time and respect and consideration and then the process should result from a fair voting and merit-based uh, analysis. Now, the second question I have about our patent system and intellectual property systems is what is the justification for these systems? Are they justified on an economic basis to spur economic growth, to incentivize investment and disclosure, or are intellectual property systems justified on a civil libertarian basis? and perhaps the most important civil liberty, which is our individual right to possess property. Now, when you have debates about intellectual property, both sides frequently conflate these two issues. I can candidly say I only see an economic justification for intellectual property law. I do not think there is social justification for intellectual property law. It is merely an economic construct and a very valuable one. Much like contract law, where we encourage efficient breach. We do not hold people to fulfill contracts if that would create social waste. With intellectual property, I also think we should encourage efficient infringement. And if we only justify intellectual property on an economic basis, that means the head of equity should not participate in any intellectual property disputes. This means injunctions should never be granted for violating an intellectual property right because an injunction is merely an equitable remedy, not a legal remedy. Now having said that, the immediate response is, if I have a patent on my pharmaceutical or on my computer program, I can't let other people infringe it at will or else I'll never invest. My answer is, you do not need an injunction as a matter of law. All you need is a fair deliberative process to set the correct ongoing royalty and if a competing firm, a rival firm, can enter the market, pay you your handsome royalty, and still make net profit, then we should encourage that firm to enter and compete with you. But if the amount of royalty owed to you for your innovation is greater than the competitor can make from entering the market, you will have a de facto injunction because no rational actor will enter. This is what I call, uh, uh, this is what I call efficient infringement. And therefore, I see no justification for uh, injunctions in an intellectual property system. And this is why I think the intellectual property systems which adopt injunctions 
are somehow being justified on this property or civil liberty basis, which I disagree with. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we have to ask, what is the purpose of our intellectual property systems? Is it to reward individuals who make investments and advances? Or is it to advance the state of technology available to the public? I submit it is the latter. And the former is merely an intermediate step to get there. So in the debate between property and liberty, my vote is always for liberty. Thank you for your time.